Hey folks, I don't normally do narration, but this one's a bit special, so I'm gonna give it a shot. I've gotten a lot of questions about how to get started scratch building spaceships, so I wanted to make a dedicated video where I talk through my process. What makes this one extra special is that this ship, the VX7 Personal Transport, is my own design, and I've put the pattern for it up for sale if you wanna try building it too. I've included a link in the description, so if you like the video and you want to try scratch building it yourself, you can go ahead and check it out. With that out of the way, let's get started with the tools that I use during a build. First, a pencil for marking your parts. A hobby knife or an X-Acto blade with extra blades. I usually go through about three or four in a single project. A nail file or a sanding stick. Regular sandpaper is also useful. A set of tweezers a metal square or ruler. You don't want to use a plastic one because you can easily damage it with your knife. A liquid cement or a solvent for your plastics. The kind that I like to use is IPS Weld On 3. If you don't have a liquid cement, you can just use regular super glue as well. This is especially useful if you have parts that the solvent can't dissolve. I also like to use a cheap brush for applying the solvent. I didn't wave them in front of the camera, but you also want a pair of scissors and a roll of masking tape. If you use the super glue, toothpicks are useful for getting it into tight corners. There are two different thicknesses of styrene that I like to work with, 020 inches and 040 inches. The 020 is thin, easy to cut, and good for details, and the 040 is thicker and good for structural stuff. The template I made is split into two sections for the two different weights of styrene. I'm going to start with the thinner ones even though it's out of order because I wanted to. The corners of this piece of styrene I have are already right angles which is nice because it'll save me some time cutting and I'll make fewer off cuts. Once the template is nice and firmly taped to the plastic, I'm ready to start cutting. I mentioned earlier it's important to use a metal guide while you do this or you can completely destroy your ruler. I've actually done this before so you can take my word for it. Styrene is really easy to cut. In fact, I don't even need to cut all the way through. I just scored along the lines where I want it to break. And that's all the O2O pieces cut out. The O4O is mostly the same, but there are a couple things to be aware of. The first is, because it's thicker, it doesn't break as cleanly sometimes. So what I'll usually do is cut past the corners to ensure that it doesn't splinter as much. One of the nice things about this shape is I get a lot of these little right angle triangular bits out of it. They're useful for later, so I'm going to hold on to them. You can kind of see here that these inside corners didn't come out as cleanly as I wanted. Fortunately, it's a pretty easy fix. I'm just going to take my hobby knife here and just barely cut down into them. I'm using very little pressure here. This is essentially just letting the knife do the work. Beyond that, cutting the O4 styrene is more or less the same as cutting the O2 styrene, if a little more satisfying to snap. I skip forward a bit, and here's every piece of the ship all cut out 
and arranged together. And with that, we're just about ready to start assembly. The first step is attaching all of these little rectangles to the corners of the base. You need very little weld on. I only use like half a drop's worth for each one. It bonds almost instantly, but there's a second or two where you can wiggle it around to get it into place. Now here's where those triangles come in useful. They act as a gusset. This adds both structural strength, and it makes sure that it's a nice 90 degree angle between the rectangle and the piece underneath it. Don't worry if the pieces don't quite line up perfectly. If there are any rough edges, we can sand them down later. The next few steps are more or less the same. This one is nice because you don't actually need a gusset to attach it. You can see it lines up with the piece we've already attached. These next pieces need to fit in between the pieces that are already there. This can be a little tricky, and you may need to cut them down in order to make sure they fit. Once they're in place though, while the plastic is still soft, you can actually smoosh them around a bit to help them fit. Don't be afraid to let the plastic overlap and hang off of edges, but be careful of leaving gaps. It's much easier to remove excess than it is to fill in empty space. Lining up the corners here is important, because if they aren't straight, when I put the lid on in the next step, it won't align with the parts in the beginning. Step 5 is more the same. Bond the sides, and apply the gusset. The next step is a little trickier. The first part goes on as normal, but piece number 10 needs to fit in between 8A and 8B. As it is, the one I cut is a little bit too wide. So I'm gonna trim it down a teeny bit. Now, you might find it a little easier to sand this, but I like using the knife. Either way, it needs to get a little bit smaller. Angled parts on this next step can make it a little bit awkward, but getting them all together just comes down to the same techniques. So now with the canopy done, we've finished all the sub-assemblies. But there's a problem. The surface of this piece is flat, but the edges along here aren't. You can see it especially on these two pieces, where the gap is really obvious. The solution? Sanding.
The last thing to do here is to attach the fins. But once again, there's a problem. The corner here won't make for a firm connection to the fin. So you guessed it, more sanding. The first time I used the solvent to make a connection like this, I was worried it wouldn't be secure enough, but it comes out being surprisingly strong. The weld on is some powerful stuff. I didn't sand down the smaller fins, because even though it's not a perfectly flat connection, the solvent did the work of keeping them in place. Which means the main assembly is done. Kind of. You can see that most of these corners and edges aren't terribly clean. You know what that means. More sanding. If you're following a pattern, there's not much to this step. Just cut them out and attach them. That said, panelizing is a great spot to make a model really your own creation. A different panel layout can totally change the character of a ship. No matter what the pattern is though, the basic principle is the same. Panels break up big flat areas and add detail. This makes the model more interesting to look at and implies a more complicated construction than there actually is. panels themselves can be as simple or as complicated as you like. I tend to do a lot of these little details freehand. They're small enough that if they aren't perfect, you can't really tell. And with that, I think I'm happy with the panels on this one. Here's another of the same model that I built, but with a different panel layout. You can see how it has a pretty different vibe going for it. The last thing I want to do is add some thrusters in the back, and you might already have some stuff that will work well for this. Markers or glue caps often have an interesting shape to them that's very spaceshipy. These are wheels from off of a toy car, and I think they make a pretty convincing little thrust exhaust. And if you want something extra fancy, wheels from a model tank kit have a lot of little fine details. For this model, I'm going to use the car wheels. They're just the right size to pop into the back. I don't know what kind of plastic they're made of, so I'm going to use the super glue to hold them in place. And with that done, construction of the model is complete. The first step of painting is going to be hitting these guys with a coat of primer. I've got this can of dark gray spray primer and it'll do just fine for this. I mounted my models on a couple of bamboo skewers and here's what they look like after being primed. I want to keep this paint job pretty simple, so I'm only going to use four colors. A matte black, a light gray, a dark red, and a shiny silver. The black is only for the canopy, and I tried to get as thin a coat as I could to avoid having brush strokes. The gray I'm using to highlight a couple of panels. To do this, I'm going to stipple it on with this old flat brush. Stippling prevents obvious brush strokes, and it also looks a bit like worn chipped paint, which is cool. I'm going to do the same stippling technique with the dark red as I did with the gray. Because the red stands out a lot more than the gray, I'm going to do fewer panels in this color. Last, the silver gets this one teeny panel on the front, and the engines in the back. Now the ship is all painted, but it's still looking a little flat. To fix this, we're going to hit it with a pass of weathering. 
To protect the paint I've already put down, I covered everything in a satin top coat, which gives it just a bit of a shine. For the weathering, I'm going to use a black oil paint. You can use other colors if you like, burnt umber is a classic, but I'm trying to keep this simple, so I'm sticking just to black. There's more talented folks out there who've explained weathering better than I ever could, so I'll be brief here. The long and short of it is you rub a mess into every nook and cranny you can, and then do your best to wipe it all back off. The last thing I want to add are some shiny dings and scratches. You can use the same silver paint from earlier for this, but if you have one, a metallic alcohol pen like this is a great way to do it quick and dirty. The weathering stage can be tough, because if you wanted to, you could just keep adding pass after pass, layer after layer. I wanted to keep things more reined in though, so now that the silver is on, I'm calling this project done. Thanks for watching the video, and again, if you want to try building this model yourself, I've included a link below to where you can buy a template. I think I've done a good job of making it an easy and fun entry point into a hobby that, frankly, can be a bit intimidating. On top of that, if you do buy one, you're directly supporting the channel, and helping me make and share more cool stuff like this. If you do build a VX7, I would love to see it. You can share it with me here, or on Twitter, where I'm also at Sublight Drive. Last, if you liked the narration, or if you'd prefer the older non-talking videos, let me know in the comments. It was an interesting experiment, and I think I'd like to try getting better at it.